Number of the Stars, Chapter 8, There Has Been a Death. Through a haze of dreams, Anne-Marie heard Henrik rise and leave the house, headed for the barn with his milking pail at daybreak. <clears throat> Later, when she woke again, it was morning. She could hear birds calling outside, one of them close by the window in the apple tree, and she could hear Mama below in the kitchen talking to Kirsty. Ellen was still asleep. The night before, so shortened by the soldiers in the Copenhagen apartment, seemed long ago. Anne-Marie rose quietly so that she wouldn't wake her friend. She pulled on her clothes and went down the narrow, curved staircase to find her sister kneeling on the kitchen floor trying to make the gray kitten drink water from a bowl. Silly, she said. Kittens like milk, not water. I am teaching this one new habits, Kirsty explained importantly, and I have named him Thor, for the god of thunder. Anne-Marie burst out laughing. She looked at the tiny kitten who was shaking his head, irritated at his wet whiskers as Kirsty kept trying to dip his face to the water. "'God of thunder,' Anne-Marie said. "'He looks as if he would run and hide if there were a thunderstorm. "'He has a mother someplace who would comfort him, I imagine,' Mama said. "'And when he wants milk, he'll find his mamma. "'Or he could go visit the cow,' Kirsty said. "'Although Uncle Henrik no longer raised crops on the farm as his parents had, "'he still kept a cow, who munched happily on the meadow grass "'and gave a little milk each day in return. "'Now and then he was able to send cheese into Copenhagen to his sister's family. "'This morning, Anne-Marie noticed with delight— Mama had made oatmeal, and there was a pitcher of cream on the table. It was a very long time since she had tasted cream. At home they had bread and tea every morning. Mama followed Anne Marie's eyes to the pitcher. Fresh from blossom, she said. Henrik milks her every morning before he leaves for the boat. And, she added, there's butter, too. Usually not even Henrik has butter, but he managed to save a little this time. Save a little from what? Anne Marie asked, spooning oatmeal into a floured bowl. Don't tell me the soldiers try to, what's the word, "'Relocate butter, too,' she laughed at her own joke. "'But it wasn't a joke at all. "'Though Mama laughed ruefully. "'They do,' she said. "'They re relocate all the farmer's butter right into the stomach of their army. "'I suppose that if they knew Henrik had kept his tiny, this tiny bit, "'they would come with guns and march it away down the path.' "'Kirsty joined their laughter as the three of them pictured a mound of frightened butter under military arrest. "'The kitten d darted away when Kirsty's attention was distracted and settled on the window sill. "'Suddenly here in this sunlit kitchen,' with cream in a pitcher, and a bird in the apple tree beside the door, and out in the Kattegat, where Uncle Henrik, surrounded by bright blue sky and water, pulled in his nets filled with shiny silver fish. Suddenly the specter of guns and grim-faced soldiers seemed nothing more than a ghost story, a joke with which to frighten children in the dark. Ellen appeared in the kitchen doorway, smiling sleepily, and Mama put another flowered bowl of steaming oatmeal on the old t wooden table. Cream, Anne-Marie said, gesturing to the pitcher with a grin. All day long, the girls played outdoor, out of doors, under the brilliant clear sky and sun. Anne-Marie took Ellen to the small pasture beyond the barn and introduced her to Blossom, who gave a lazy, rough-textured lick to the palm of Ellen's hand when she extended it timidly. The kitchen scam kitten scampered about and chased flying insects across the meadow. The girls picked armfuls of wildflowers, dried brown, now by the early fall chill, and arranged them in pots and pitchers until the tabletops were crowded with their bouquets. Inside the house, Mama scrubbed and dusted, tisk-tisking at Uncle Henrik's untidy housekeeping. She took the rugs out to the clothesline and beat them with a stick, scattering dust into the air. He needs a wife, she said, shaking her head, and attacked the old wooden floors with a broom while the rugs aired. Just look at this, she said, opening the door to the little, little used formal living room with its old-fashioned furniture. He never dusts. And she picked up her cleaning rags. And Kirsty, she added, the god of thunder made a very small rain shower in the corner of the kitchen floor. Keep an eye on him. Late in the afternoon, Uncle Henrik came home. He grinned when he saw the newly cleaned and polished house, the double doors to the living room wide open, the rugs aired and the windows washed. Henrik, you need a wife, Mama scolded him. Uncle Henrik laughed and joined Mama on the steps near the kitchen door. Why do I need a wife when I have a sister? He asked in a, his booming voice. Mama sighed, but her eyes were twinkling. "'And you need to stay home more often to take care of the house. "'This step is broken, and there's a leaking faucet in the kitchen, "'and Henrik was grin grinning at her, shaking his head in mock dismay. "'And there are mice in the attic, and my brown sweater has a big mouth moth hole in the sleeve, "'and if I don't wash the window soon,' they laughed together. "'Anyway,' Mama said, "'I have opened every window, Henrik, to let the air in and the sunlight. "'Thank goodness it is such a beautiful day. "'Tomorrow will be a day for fishing,' Henrik said, his smile disappearing. "'Amory, listening, recognized the odd phrase.' Papa had said something like it on the telephone. Is the weather good for fishing, Henrik? Papa had asked. But what did it mean? Henrik went fishing every day, rain or shine. 
Denmark's fishermen didn't wait for sunny days to take their boats out and throw their nets into the sea. <clears throat> Anne-Marie, silent, sitting with Ellen under the apple tree, watched her uncle. Mama looked at him. The weather is right? she asked. Henrik nodded and looked at the sky. He smelled the air. I will be going back to the boat tonight after supper. We will leave very early in the morning. I will stay on the boat all night. Anne-Marie wondered what it would be like to be on a boat all night. To lie at anchor, hearing the sea slap against the sides, to see the stars from your place on the sea. You have prepared the living room? Uncle Henrik asked suddenly. Mama nodded. It is cleaned, and I moved the furniture a bit to make room. And you saw the flowers, she added. I hadn't thought of it, but the girls picked dried flowers from the meadow. Prepare the living room for what? Anne-Marie asked. Why did you move the furniture? Mama looked at Uncle Henrik. He had reached down for the kitten, a scampering past, and now held it against his chest and scratched its chin gently. It arched its small back with pleasure. Well, girls, he said, it is a sad event, but not too sad, really, because she was very, very old. There's been a death, and tonight your great Aunt Bertie will be resting in the living room, in her casket, before she is buried tomorrow. It is the old custom, you know, for the dead to rest at home, and their loved ones to be with them before burial. Kirsty was listening with a fascinated look. Right here, she asked, a dead person? Right here? Anne Marie said nothing. She was confused. This was the first she had heard of a death in the family. No one had called Copenhagen to say that there had been a death. No one had seemed sad. And most puzzling of all, she had never heard the name before. Great Aunt Bertie. Surely she would have known if she had a relative by that name. Kirsty might not. Kirsty was little and didn't pay attention to such things. But Aunt Marie did. She had always been fascinated by her mother's stories of her own childhood. She remembered the names of all the cousins, the great aunts and uncles who had been a tease, who had who had been a grouch, who had been such a scold that her husband had finally moved away to a different house, though they continued to have dinner together every night. Such wonderful, interesting stories filled with the colorful personalities of her mother's family. And Anne-Marie was quite, quite certain, though she said nothing, there was no great Aunt Bertie. She didn't exist. <clears throat> Chapter 9. Why Are You Lying? Anne-Marie went outside alone after supper, through the open kitchen window, she could hear Mama and Ellen talking as they washed the dishes. Kirsty, she knew, was busy on the floor playing with the old dolls she had found upstairs, the dolls that had been Mama's once long ago. The kitten had fled when she was the kitten had fled when she tried to dress it and disappeared. She wandered to the barn where Uncle Henrik was milking Blossom. He was kneeling on the straw-covered floor beside the cow, his shoulder pressed against her heavy side, his strong tanned hands rhythmically urging her milk into the spotless bucket. The god of thunder sat alertly poised nearby, watching. Blossom looked up at Anne-Marie with big brown eyes and moved her wrinkled mouth like an old woman adjusting false teeth. Anne-Marie leaned against the ancient splintery wood of the barn wall and listened to the sharp, rattling sound of the streams of milk as they hit the sides of the bucket. Uncle Henrik glanced over at her and smiled without pausing in the rhythm of milking. He didn't say anything. Through the barn windows, the pinkish light of sunset fell in irregular shapes upon a, the stacked hay. Flecks of dust and straw floated there in the light. "'Uncle Henrik,' Anne-Marie said suddenly, her voice cold, "'you are lying to me. You and Mama both.' His strong hands continued, deftly pressing it like a pulse against the cow. The steady streams of milk still came. He looked at her again, his deep blue eyes kind and questioning. "'You are angry,' he said. "'Yes. Mama has never lied to me before. Never.' But I know there is no great Aunt Bertie. Never once in all the stories I've heard and all the old pictures I've seen has there been a great Aunt Bertie. Uncle Henrik sighed. Blossom looked back at him, as if to say, almost done, and indeed the streams of milk lessened and slowed. He tugged at the cow gently but firmly, pulling down the last of the milk. The bucket was half full, frothy on the top. Finally, he set it aside and washed the cow's udder with a clean, damp cloth. Then he lifted the bucket to a shelf and covered it. He rubbed the cow's neck affectionately. At last he turned to Anne-Marie as he wiped his own hands with the cloth. "'How brave are you, little Anne-Marie?' he asked suddenly. She was startled and dismayed. It was a question she did not want to be asked. When she asked it of herself, she didn't like her own answer. "'Not very,' she confessed, looking at the floor of the barn. Tall Uncle Henrik knelt before her so that his face was level with hers. Behind him, Blossom lowered her head, grasped a mouthful of hay in her mouth, and drew it in with her tongue. The kitten cocked its head, waiting, still hoping for, a, for spilled milk. "'I think that is not true,' Uncle Henrik said. "'I think you are like your mama, and like your papa, and like me. Frightened, but determined, and if the time came to be brave, I am quite sure you would be very, very brave.' "'But,' he added, "'it is much easier to be brave, 
if you do not know any, everything. And so your mama does not know everything, neither do I. We know only what we need to know. Do you understand what I am saying? he asked, looking into her eyes. And Marie frowned. She wasn't sure. What did bravery mean? She had been very frightened the day not long ago, though now it seemed far in the past, when the soldier had stopped her on the street and asked questions in his rough voice. And she had not known everything then. She had not known that the Germans were going to take away the Jews. And so when the soldier asked, looking at Ellen that day, what is your friend's name, she had been able to answer him, even though she was frightened. If she had known everything, it would have not been so easy to be brave. She began to understand, just a little. Yes, she said to Uncle Henrik, I think I understand. You guessed correctly, he told her. There is no great Aunt Bertie, and never has been. Your mama lied to you, and so did I. We did so, he explained, to help you to be brave, because we love you. Will you forgive us for that? Anne-Marie nodded. She felt older, suddenly. And I'm not going to tell you any more. Not now, for the same reason. Do you understand? Anne-Marie nodded again. Suddenly there was a noise outside. Uncle Henrik's shoulders stiff stiffened. He rose quick quickly, went to the window of the barn, stood in the shadows, and looked out. Then he turned back to Anne-Marie. It is the hearse, he said. It is great Aunt Bertie, who never was, he smiled wryly. So, my little friend, it is time for the night of mourning to begin. Are you ready? Anne-Marie took her uncle's hand, and he led her from the barn. The gleaming wooden casket rested on supports in the center of the living room and was surrounded by the fragile papery flowers that Anne-Marie and Ellen had picked that afternoon. Lighted candles stood in, in holders on the table and cast a soft, flickering light. The hearse had gone, and the solemn-faced men who had carried the casket indoors had gone with it, after speaking quietly to Uncle Henrik. Kersey had gone to bed reluctantly, complaining that she wanted to stay up with the others, that she was grown up enough, that she had never seen a dead person in a closed-up box, that it wasn't fair. But Mama had been firm, and finally Kirsty, sulking, had trudged upstairs with her dolls under one arm and the kitten under the other. Ellen was silent and had a sad expression. "'I'm so sorry your Aunt Bertie died,' Anne-Marie heard her say to, to Mama, who smiled sadly and thanked her. Anne-Marie had listened and said nothing. "'So now, too, I... and so now I, too, am lying,' she thought, "'and to my very best friend. "'I could tell Ellen that it isn't true that there is no great Aunt Bertie. "'I could take her aside and whisper the secret to her that so that she wouldn't have to feel sad.' But she didn't. She understood that she was protecting Ellen the way her mother had protected her. Although she didn't understand what was happening or why the casket was there or who, in truth, was in it, she knew that it was better, safer, for Ellen to believe in Great Aunt Bertie. So she said nothing. Other people came as the night sky grew darker. A man and a woman, both of them dressed in dark clothing. The woman carrying a sleeping baby appeared at the door, and Uncle Henrik gestured them inside. They nodded to Mama and to the girls. They went, following Uncle Henrik to the living room, and sat down quietly. "'Friends of Great Aunt Bertie,' Mama said quietly in response to Anne-Marie's questioning look. Anne-Marie knew that Mama was lying again, and she could see that Mama understood that she knew. They looked at each other for a long time and said nothing. In that moment, with that look, they became equals. From the living room came the sound of a sleepy baby's brief wail. Anne-Marie glanced through the door and saw the woman open her blouse and begin to nurse the infant, who quieted. Another man arrived, an old man, bearded. Quietly he went to the living room and sat down, saying nothing to the others who only glanced at him. The young woman lifted her baby's blanket, covering its face and her own breast. The old man bent his head forward and closed his eyes, as if he were praying. His mouth moved silently, forming words that no one could hear. Anne-Marie stood in the doorway, watching the mourners as they sat in the candlelit room. Then she turned back to the kitchen and began to help Ellen and Mama as they prepared food. In Copenhagen, she remembered, when Lise died, friends had come to their apartment every evening. All of them had brought food so that Mama wouldn't need to cook. Why hadn't these people brought food? Why didn't they talk? In Copenhagen, even though the talk was sad, people had spoken softly to one another and to Mama and Papa. They had talked about Lise, remembering happier times. Thinking about it as she sliced cheese in the kitchen, Anne-Marie realized that these people had nothing to talk about. They couldn't speak of happier times with Great Aunt Bertie when there had never been a Great Aunt Bertie at all. Uncle Henrik came into the kitchen. He glanced at his watch and then at Mama. It's getting late, he said. I should go to the boat. He looked worried. He blew out the candle so that there would be no light at all and opened the door. He stared beyond the gnarled apple tree into the darkness. Good, here they come, he said in a low, l relieved voice. Ellen, come with me. Ellen looked questioningly toward Mama, who nodded. Go with Henrik, she said. Anne-Marie watched still holding the wedge of firm cheese in her hand as Ellen followed Uncle Henrik into the yard. 
She could hear a sharp, low cry from Ellen, and then the sound of voices speaking softly. In a moment, Uncle Henrik returned. Behind him was Peter Nielsen. Tonight, Peter went first to Mama and hugged her. Then he hugged Anne Marie and kissed her on the cheek, but he said nothing. There was no playfulness to his affection tonight, just a sense of urgency, of worry. He went immediately to the living room, looked around, and nodded at the silent people there. Ellen was still outside, but in a moment the door opened and she returned, held tightly, like a little girl, her bare legs dangling against her father's chest. Her mother was beside them.